I'm excited to be continuing our series on being led by the Spirit. I want to thank Pastor Charlie for trusting me enough to share with you guys. A um, couple of weeks ago, we began this series, and Pastor Charlie began to tell us and talk to us about how God is constantly, God is constantly trying to move us to a better place. How many of you are gl glad about that? God is trying to constantly move us to a better place, but we have to be willing to move. Amen? When God says move, he's not only given us Christ, but he's given us the Holy Spirit. I call that the internal GPS for life with less stress and mess, but more success. God has given us that to keep us on track to make sure that we're following him and so that we're living these lives that he's given us uh, more, more fulfilled lives with less stress, less mess. And God is constantly speaking and leading by his spirit, which if we're wise, we will validate, we will validate by his word and by his gift that he has given us called the church, the body of Christ. Now, I can't do so much review, but the last two weeks, if you missed the last two weeks, I'm going to tell you, you need to go back and listen to those messages. This week, we've been having some great discussion and conversations. Our pastoral staff and our team has engaged with some people who have been impacted by the word of God over these last couple of weeks. People who are making decisions, big life decisions, Somebody say big life decision. I'm not talking about whether, whether to have uh, cream in your coffee. I'm talking about big life decisions. People are making big life decisions, and we need to hear God's word. And this, this week, there was a couple who heard the message. One of the, the members of the couple, the marriage couple, heard the message, and they were considering separating, getting a divorce. Well, this week... They, made, they had a discussion and they, ha they made a decision to not get a divorce, but to, to seek counsel and to fight for their marriage. Come on, somebody say amen. God is constantly trying to get us to a better place. And today we want to consider three more things as we, as we work on being better led by the Spirit of God. We, I'm going to give us three things that we need to consider that will help us. Because here, here, here's the main point, the main thrust of this message today. God is trying to lead us to a better place. But how we receive and respond to his word determines our fruitfulness. He's trying to lead us to the land of good and plenty, blessing, less stress, less mess, more success, but we have to do our part, amen? amen? And how we receive and respond to his word will contribute to that in large, in, in, a, in a huge way. Jesus illustrated this fact by telling a parable. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Most of these parables that Jesus told, they were stories that had a zinger to it. I love listening to the parables. In fact, we've done sermon series on the parables of Christ. They are earthly stories with heavenly meanings. And Jesus tells this story to illustrate how important it is for us to receive well the word of God and respond to it. He said this, he said, there was a sower who went about, a farmer who went about sowing seed. And as he went about sowing seed, some of the seed fell on the pathway. And that seed got trampled upon. Birds came down and ate up the seed. How many of you know about the birds coming and eating up your seed? The lawn doctors. Well, obviously, that didn't produce any fruit. He said also some of the seed, as the farmer was sowing, fell among the stony ground. And on that stony ground, what happened was the fruit actually started to come up. The seed started to sprout, but it didn't last very long because it couldn't get adequate moisture from the roots. 
And so after a while, the plants just ended up withering. And then it says that the seed also fell among the thorns. Some of the seed fell. I guess that this, this particular farmer was just throwing, a, just throwing seed. He had a lot of seed. <laughs> but it said it fell amongst the thorns. And what happened is the, the, the fruit came up. If it began to flourish, but it ended up getting choked out because of the thorns that grew up with it. And then lastly, some of that seed, thank God, fell upon good soil. And it says that it, 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 it ended up bearing fruit a hundred times what was planted. Everybody say a hundred times. Now, some theologians believe that this was the actual zinger, right, in, in it because you don't get a hundred times yield of a crop. Elder Bo knows that, right? You don't get a hundred times. But this was a miraculous, a miraculous crop that ended up being yielded. Well, with some of his parables, Jesus didn't even explain them. But with this one, we actually get the explanation. I want us to actually read Luke chapter 8, verses 11 through 15. Let's read. Jesus says, this is the meaning of the parable. Thank you, Jesus. Make it easy for us. He said all kinds of crazy things. Eat my eat my blood my body and drink my my blood <laughs> Jesus what you talking about <laughs> here he just he explains it so let's read it this is the meaning of the parable the seed is the word of god those along the path are the ones who hear and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by pers persevering, produce a crop. Guys, I, I read this parable for the first time about 24 years ago. 24 years ago. And it was one of the first, some proper would say pericopes, but one of the first sections, I'm sorry, my doctoral studies is, are still in my mind. It was part of the Bible that I was like, wow. <laughs> wow, that, whoa. Are you serious? Is this what is happening? And I remember actually taking that and writing down some notes for the first time in my Bible. And I said, if I, could, if I can get this. If I can understand this, the Lord might be able to help me to live this life a little bit better. And I continue to go back to this scripture because Jesus said something. He said, he that has ears to hear, let them hear. If you want success, you want life with less stress, less mess. He says, this is a critically important thing to understand. Number one, we need to understand that as much as God wants to lead us by his spirit, we have an enemy who doesn't want us to be led by his spirit. We don't talk about the enemy very much in church these days, but we have an enemy, the devil, Satan. He doesn't want us to be successful. He has a grudge against us because he has a grudge against God. And we're made in the image of God. He doesn't want us to have what God wants for us. We need to understand that. And one of the ways that the enemy steals from us, the Bible says, Jesus said, I come to give you life more abundantly, but the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy Steal, kill, and destroy. 
that was eye-opening to me. There, there, there is someone who I can't see, who I can't just, you know, throw my dukes up. <laughs> Back in my neighborhood, right? You trying to steal, kill, destroy. What? But we can't do that with, uh, with this enemy. He's a spirit, right? We can't see him. And he doesn't come to us in a, in a, with a pitchfork and a red suit. But one of the ways that he comes to us, one of his most effective tactics and ways that he steals from us is to keep us from receiving God's word. Listen. The enemy does not have to get you to rob a bank to ruin your life. He doesn't have to get us strung out on drugs to ruin our lives. He just has to keep God's word from us. Luke 8, 12, let's read it together. It says, the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so they may not believe and be saved. Like a great war tactician, the enemy, one of the first things that he tries to do is to cut off communication between us and our commanding chief. He knows that if he can take away the communication, right, this is basic stuff. In war, we are at war. I'll just cut off the communication, have them scramble. They can't be effective that way. The enemy knows that God's word has the ability to produce life-changing faith in those who continually hear and receive it. Life-changing faith. And listen, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the enemy doesn't want us to even hear God's word. Faith is the very substance of of things hoped for, the Bible says. Listen, if you're, you're a person who's lacking hope, when we're lacking hope, we're in a dangerous place. And the enemy knows that. He doesn't want us to start putting our faith, our confidence in God because he knows that that produces hope. And if we have hope, we really have something. There was a POW by the name of Lloyd Ponder. He was interviewed. He served in World War II. He was a vet who, who had actually been captured by the Japanese army. And one of the things that he said was, you know, I had to keep hope. I kept thinking about my family and I kept telling myself, other things may happen to other people, but I'm going to get out of here. He kept his hope alive, and he ended up surviving because of his hope. Listen, we serve the God of all hope. This world is a mess. Our hope and confidence needs to be grounded in something other than what we see happening around us. Lloyd Ponder said, having hope can get you through anything. There may be some this morning, you're, you are in a tough situation, and you may feel like there's, there's nothing that can be done. Well, I'm here to tell you that there is something that can be done, because God is the God of hope. The enemy knows that confident hope in God increases our fruitfulness exponentially it helps us to not only survive but to thrive look verse 8 of Luke it said it came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown can I just submit to you this morning that I'm living a life that's a hundred times better than what it should be if I told you my upbringing, if we had a a chance to sit down and talk, you would be sad for me. I didn't realize that until I went through glorious mess. (laughs) 
said, we had a part of Glorious Mess, you have to write out your stories and the others who are in it, they read it. And after everybody read my story, they were like, I could see it on their faces. I was like, what, guys? <laughs> I didn't realize that my story was as sad as it was. <laughs> Everybody say, but God, the God of all hope, the enemy does not want us putting our confidence in God. Have you ever wondered why it's so difficult for us to spend time in God's word? It's easier for us to watch hours upon hours of Netflix (laughs) we could watch the bad news every evening before we go to bed but to read God's word for 30 minutes is a struggle part of that is our human nature right but you know what part of it is that there's a spiritual battle being waged for our souls and for the souls of our loved ones. And the enemy doesn't want us to pick up our, one of our most powerful weapons, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. How many of you ever heard the saying, you're taking a gun to a, or a knife to a gunfight? Well, some of us are taking a butter knife to a sword fight. This is a spiritual battle. The apostle Paul said, take up the sword of the spirit, which is the the word of God. Listen, even when we hear God's word, even when we put ourselves in the place to hear God's word, we're here this morning, praise God. We're in the place to hear God's word. Give yourselves a hand. Come on. That's how you fight the enemy. Even when we hear God's word, though, the enemy works hard to get us to doubt it and to disobey it. We see this from the beginning with Eve. You will not certainly die, is what he told Eve. But we also see that Eve was a little shaky with the word of God. She said, he said we couldn't eat it nor touch it. God didn't say he could, all of that. But the enemy came in and said, no, you will not certainly die. He tried that with Jesus when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will give his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. But you know what? Jesus was the word of God in flesh. No devil, not today. How many of you like that song? Tell the devil, no, not today, not today, not today. It repeated if somebody needed that repeat in that song. (laughs) But Jesus said, no, because it is also written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Jesus knew the word. I heard, I read an alarming statistic. Don't you just love it when people say that? An alarming statistic. (laughs) I have a theory about statistics. One in three of them are erroneous. (laughs) But doesn't that sound good? One in three statistics are erroneous. I just made that up. Just made it up. But let's say that the statistic is true. This this is the alarming statistics I heard by LifeWay Research. Half of Americans engage with the Bible in some way, shape, or form. Whether it's through reading or coming to church, they engage with God's word. Only half. But listen to this. Only one-third of Americans 
actually pick up the Bible and read it themselves. Now, God's word says that his word is the sword of the spirit. And here we are in a battle that we cannot fight with our hands. But what what that statistic, if it is true, what it says is that we're fighting the enemy disarmed in large part. And so I have a challenge for us this morning. Are you ready for the challenge? That's what a good coach does, right? He says, come on, you can do a little better than what you're doing. Coach Mike. (laughs) Now, if 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 I saw if I let, just if I was a basketball coach and I saw that you were missing layups, what would I do as a coach? He said, "Bench me, <laughs> maybe." <laughs> I would try to get you to maybe work on that, right? Okay, so here's what I would. And by the way, I'm encouraging myself. Let's work on this. Let's increase the life-changing message of God's word in our lives. Do you know when I, when I read that parable 20-some odd years ago, that was one of the challenges that I said, I'm, I'm going to take up. I'm going to tell the devil, no, not today. And I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going to read some scripture. I, I may not know what I'm reading. <laughs> And a lot of the times I didn't know. And sometimes I still don't know. And I'm like, Lord, help me to understand this. But let's increase the life-changing message of God's word in our lives. How can we do that? Number one, I want to encourage us to prioritize the Sunday message. Prioritize the Sunday message. The gift of God is here on Sunday mornings to teach and preach the word of God. Let's prioritize that in our attendance. If you're attending once or twice a month, maybe come three, three times a month. You know what I said when I really got serious about following God? I said, my face is going to be in the place. Uh, Lord, I promise you, if the doors of the church are open, I'm going to be there. Now, I had a whole bunch of stuff that I was asking the Lord. I was trying to write up a contract. Lord, if you get me out of this and you get me, I'll I'll be in your house, Lord. Whereas before, I think the first time, like, when I really seriously started going to church, the first time I went, the first Sunday I went to this one particular church that really helped me to get grounded in God's word. I went there one Sunday, and the next Sunday I think I didn't go, and they called and left a message and said, hey, we missed you. And in my mind, I was like, you're going to miss me a lot, Jack. Because I don't know anybody that goes to church every Sunday. (laughs) But why not make it a goal? If we're not out of town, if we're not sick, why not come and hear God's word? The life-changing word of God. Why not take notes? Pastor Charlie says we're a note-taking church. Come on, engage a little bit more. God, I know you're going to say something to me, and I want to remember it, so I'm going to take some notes. I'm not going to just come in and sit and listen and then let it maybe go out in one ear, out the other. You know what the enemy is saying? <laughs> God, I ain't, you ain't getting that in your heart. I'm going to take that word before you get out the door. prioritize Sunday message. Those of us who serve, we're supposed to serve one and what? Huh? (laughs) Serve one and serve one and sit one. Don't let the enemy get you in a habit of coming and serving and then leaving. As we begin to serve, we need God's word even more. Let's prioritize the Sunday message. Here's another one. Let's contend. Let's fight. Come on, let's fight to spend time in God's word on our own. Weekly. I would even say daily, but I don't want to scare anybody. (laughs) 
let's, let's, let's contend. Let's fight to do this. God's word is important that it gets in our hearts. I, we say, I've heard it said that God's, the Bible is God's love letter to us. Now, check this out. How many of us would be away, say we're away at war. This is Memorial Day weekend. A lot of war references. <laughs> Let's say we're away at war. And we get a letter from one of our loved ones. Are we going to just give that letter to somebody to read a little bit of it to us every week? Or are we going to dive into that love letter and read it and read it and read it and read it and cherish it and hold on to it? Wouldn't that just make sense? Listen, God has some things that he wants to say directly to us. The preaching of of God's word is a gift, and it's a blessing. But once a week makes one week. There's a pun on words there. You'll get it when you get home. I want to encourage us. Let's contend. Let's try to read a little bit on our own and, and, and really allow God to speak to us what he wants to speak to us. There's a course that we do called Foundations. It's a 10-week course. One of the things I love about Foundations is that it it actually helps us to build some, get some uh, muscle to actually do some of the, the spiritual disciplines that are so good for us. One of them is reading scripture, memorizing scripture, actually taking God's word and throughout the week, grappling with it ourselves. Listen, as we do that, we put ourselves in a better place to be led by the Spirit of God. Can we read this corporate prayer together? We're going to put it up on the screen. Let's read it. Read it with me. Oh, Lord, help us to prioritize and increase the message of your word in our lives. Help us to hear and receive your word that brings confidence, hope, and miraculously abundant living. Amen. Number two. Point number two, we need to be aware of, bad roots can lead to our short-lived fruit. Bad roots can lead to our short-lived fruit. Here's the insight. If God is constantly speaking and leading, and he is, but we're not seeing the fruitfulness we desire, it's time to look at the soil. Everybody point point at yourself and say, I'm the soil. (laughs) Look at your neighbor and say, you can't blame everything on the devil. (laughs) Luke 8, 13, let's read that scripture. It says, the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. Listen, Jesus said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear fruit. He wants us to bear fruit, but fruit that remains. He wants us to continually be fruitful, but bad roots causes short-lived fruit. Good seed rooting requires a softening of the soil. Did you note that he he said it was the the, the seed that fell upon stony ground? How many of you love the Virginia red clay we have here in Loudoun County? (laughs) Bless God. When I grew up, I never thought, I never thought I would be going to Home Depot on the weekend to buy dirt. (laughs) If you'd have told me I I would would spend money on dirt, I would laugh at you. (laughs) But what do we do? We go and we buy dirt to help improve the soil, right? We can buy the best seed. I don't know what the best seed is, but... Scots. I just, I hear, I see it on the commercials. We can go buy a biggest bag seed that they turn blue. They make it blue. It's supposed to be water enhancement and all this stuff. We can buy the biggest bag and best bag of seed that we want. But if we don't till the ground and prepare, prepare the soil, loosen it up a little bit, it's not going to help us at all. Here's a thought. Perhaps we're not seeing the fruit we desire because we have some hard spots in the lawn of our hearts 
we're not allowing God's word to penetrate. Pastor Mike, what's a hardened heart? Well, a hardened heart is a heart that just continues to not believe. It's a heart that just continues to not repent. Right? A heart that causes us to forfeit God's blessing. God's word can't penetrate a hard heart. Listen to what Jesus, or sorry, listen to what was said to the Israelites. Now, remember, they were the people who were moving with God and not moving with God. They experienced some great success, but they also took some L's. That means losses. Hebrews 11, I'm sorry, 3, verses 7 through 11. Let's read it together. It says, so as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Do you know in the midst of God doing some miraculous things, they still refuse to believe. They still refuse to receive the word of God. And God got to a point where he said, you know what? Enough is enough. None of you are going to see the promised land except for Caleb and Joshua and the young ones that are not among you right now. 40 years, a large group, a whole generation of people missed God and missed out on the promises of God because of the hardness of their hearts. And so we need to ask God to help us to to quickly receive his word. Everybody say quickly. Quickly receive his word. If you're sitting here on a Sunday morning or you're reading God's word and you feel the Holy Spirit saying act, you know what? Don't wait. Don't allow your heart to get hardened. Be quick to repent. You know, King David, when I read through King David, King David did some messed up stuff. But the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. David was quick to repent. Change my heart, O God. Create a new spirit within me. We need to be quick to repent. Good seed rooting requires the ground to remain undisturbed for a set period of time. I learned this the hard way. <laughs> because I would, I would go out and I would buy dirt. I would scratch up the soil, get it all in there, put down my grass seed. But then I would, you know, mow the lawn and do all kinds of stuff. And and the seed just wouldn't, it wouldn't be able to settle and take root. You know what? Our soil, our hearts need to be settled. We ourselves need to be settled in order to receive all that God has for us. I put a thought here. Perhaps God's word is not taking root because we just won't remain in one place long enough to get, to let God do what only he can do. You know what? Over the time that I've been here at community church, I I know this is a transient area. People come and go. One of the things that I hate as a pastor is saying goodbye to people, but you know what? I've seen some people who are just unsettled in their heart. They're leaving when they shouldn't be leaving. I was talking just last week with a family of a young man that we know, unbelievably talented, unbelievably gifted, but just won't be settled long enough for God to do what God needs to do. Just unsettled. Listen to what God says, Psalm 4610. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. When we're settled, when we allow our our roots to sink down, we, we, we are able to get all of the nourishment that God wants to give us, all the blessing that he wants to give us. You know what? 
being in that community church for 22 years, one of the blessings that I've experienced is not, a, not just seeing what God can do in me, but also having the opportunity to see what God can do in other people's lives. Not being uprooted and, oh, I'm going to go to this church this, this Sunday, and I'm going to go to this. And, oh, oh, they said something that hurt my feelings. I'm going to get up and go. Okay, well, did God say go? Or is God just trying to get you to grow? <laughs> is God trying to get you to grow or did he say go? I think you misheard. Come on, somebody say, just let your roots sink down. Listen, this is good ground. This is good soil. Thank you for that, amen. <laughs> good seed rooting requires some patient perseverance. Everybody say patient perseverance. Oh, my goodness. You put that seed down. You do all the hard work. You go and look out there. No, no grass. You water. Right? Aerate. Fertilize. Look out the window. Still nothing. You get, there's a lot of things that you just got to keep doing. Everybody say good practices, right? God's word is just a bunch of good practices. We just have to get in the habit of doing it. We got to get in the habit of doing it. And, and you know what? Before long, oh, look at that. I see something starting to sprout up. It's like going to the gym. You work out, right? You look in the mirror and you don't... But over time, you start to see the results. Here's a thought. Perhaps we just need to patiently practice God's word a little longer. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not do what? Give up. Don't give up. Right now, the, the enemy, somebody's, the enemy's whispering in somebody's ear, look, you ain't seen, you come in the church, you doing all this stuff, You're, you did everything that Pastor Charlie told you to do, and look at you. Listen, don't give up. Keep going. Keep doing what you know is right to do, and eventually, you're going to receive the blessing. Let's say this prayer, this corporate prayer together. Lord, reveal to us the hardened places of our hearts and help us to be quick to repent. Settle and quiet our hearts. Give us a patient perseverance to see your word take root in our lives and bring forth fruit that remains. Fruit that remains. The third thing that we need to consider is that worldly entanglement can choke out our fruitful development. Worldly entanglement can choke out our fruitful development. Let's read Luke chapter 8, verse 14. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. Have you ever noticed that you don't have to do one thing to get a weed to grow? <laughs> Last year, I looked out at my backyard, and I, listen, I haven't invited you to my house because I'm ashamed of my backyard. <laughs> That's one of the reasons. I let my backyard go to pot. <laughs> well, I should, I have to be careful about what I say. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any pot in my backyard. <laughs> A lot of weeds. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I might get the police to come to my house. To <laughs> A lot of thorns have sprung up.
Listen. Worry, riches, and pleasure are realities of life. They exist. The Lord knows it. But the Lord doesn't want us to allow them to choke out his best for us. The Lord knows that to be human is to worry. But he says, cast your cares upon me. Right? Before he, because he cares for us. The Lord knows that we need money and he doesn't fault us to go after money. But it, he doesn't want our worldly wealth to have control over us. Instead, he encourages us to be rich towards him. The Lord wants us to have pleasure in this life, but he wants us to depend on him for it. There's pleasure in sin for a season, but then the end result is what? It's death. That's what the scripture says. Psalm 1611 says, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The Lord prayed that we would be in the world, but not of it. We can't escape the world. He doesn't want us to, but he wants us to be in it so that we can win it. Everybody say, if you're not in it, you can't win it. John 17, 15 through 17. Let's listen to the words of Jesus. He says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. The Lord doesn't want us to be entangled and caught up in the world's unfruitful belief system. It's behaviors, it's concerns and pursuits which can stifle our growth and maturity. He doesn't want us to be entangled in that way. Just like a soldier doesn't get too entangled with the affairs of the world. Second Timothy 2 forces, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please, to please his commanding officer. All of these things can choke out, choke out God's purpose and his fruitfulness in our lives if we allow them. We have to make sure that we're putting our trust in God. The Lord wants us to build our lives upon the foundation of his word and allow it to bring forth fruit in our lives in growing measure. Everybody say growing measure. Luke eight fifteen says, but the seed of on the good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Listen, I, I, I tell you guys, sometimes I, I have to pinch myself because I remember a time when I didn't want to follow God at all. I just didn't. I took some religion, religion of the Orient classes just so that I could believe in something else other than Jesus Christ. That's a true story at George Mason. I was trying to believe in something that didn't place this command on my life to really live for God. Is there an easier way? Yin, yang, something. There was a time where I didn't want to be married. I was afraid to be married. Couldn't trust anybody any farther than I could throw them. And that wasn't very far. And I shouldn't be throwing people anyway. So anyway, <laughs> listen, there was a time when I was afraid to bring children into this world. I didn't want kids because I looked at the world and I said this, I don't want to bring any children into this place. I had a lot of thinking, a lot of cares and concerns that are of this world that were, and, and it was choking out the God purpose in my life. But when I began to seriously commit 
to aligning my life with the Word of God, he began to do something in my heart. And he began to give me a, a different purpose. He took away fear and replaced it with faith and confidence in him. And now I get to stand up here sometimes and share what the Lord has done in my life. Here's a question. What will the Lord do in you and through you if you will seriously commit to his word? If you will put your trust in him, if you will allow yourself to be planted in a place that is good soil, where God can begin to do wonderful things in your life, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God will do for those who love him. I want to encourage us all, if we're listening today, as the scripture said, don't harden your heart. Be quick to repent. Be quick to obey. Let's increase God's word in our lives. And let's respond to it. And let God do some miraculously wonderful things. Let's say our last prayer corporate prayer together. Read it with me. Lord, help us not to conform to the image of this world, but rather allow your word to transform our hearts and minds. Help us to cast our cares upon you, to find our wealth and pleasure in you, and become all you've called us to be. Lord God, we just thank you and praise you this morning, Lord, for another opportunity to hear your word. Lord, you're speaking. I pray that your people will hear Lord, let your word fall upon good ground this morning and let it bring forth fruit. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen, amen. We wanted to thank each and every one of you for your generosity throughout this season. It truly does not go unnoticed. To partner with us financially, just simply text the word GIVE to our church phone number. 571-209-5000. As always, help is just a text away. Send the word CONNECT to 571-209-5000 and a member from the team will reach out to you. Love you, Community Church. See you next week.